Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the June 12th session of the Virtual Learning Collaborative, Leveraging the HIV Response for Hepatitis C, Envisioning Rapid Start for Hepatitis C. Um, my name is Zakia Grubbs, and I'm a manager here on the hepatitis team. Um, so we have a really exciting session today, um, and the format will be, we will start with brief presentations from myself um, and Tim Horn, also from NASDAQ, um, to, I guess, give us some grounding for what we're going to talk about today. Um, and then we will have a panel discussion with Andy Dillahay of the Nebraska Health and Human Services, Rob McGoey from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and Chloe Manchester from the Maine um, centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I hope I got that right. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, and then our panel will be led by Thaddeus Pham with the Hawaii Department of Health. Um, so in the meantime, feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves. Um, let us know what jurisdiction you're coming from and also if you all have any questions. Oh, and I had all this on the screen. There we go. All right. So I am going to get started really briefly, I guess, trying to ground some of the discussion for what we are doing today or what we're going to talk about today. I'm sure most of you have heard about the National Hepatitis C uh, um, initiative coming out of the White House that is looking to really accelerate our path towards viral hepatitis elimination. Um, so with this plan from the White House, there's three prongs. The first one is point of care um, diagnostics for hepatitis C. Um, so that will help us enable a single visit test and treat programs. So that way folks will be able to get their diagnosis on the same day. Um, the second piece is the broad access to curative hepatitis C medications. So utilizing um, some pilots that have and um, programs that have been done in other jurisdictions to provide wide scale access to medications um, for folks that fall in a lot of um, different buckets, such as folks with Medicaid, folks that may be uninsured, folks that may be incarcerated, and in a bunch of other categories with limited access to um, hepatitis C treatment. And then the third bucket is empowering healthcare delivery. So in increasing screening, increasing telehealth, increasing provider awareness, increasing provider education to ensure that we're able to, to test and treat as many folks as possible. Okay, so there's a lot of moving parts on this plan and wanted to highlight some of the ways that CDC is thinking that CDC and health departments can work together to implement this plan. So for one, prevention, um, especially working on perinatal um, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, um, surveillance and case management, um, outreach and clinical care, increasing funding to jurisdictions to ensure that you all can support um, your community health centers, your um, um, community-based organizations to do testing, linkage, and treatment. And also on the surveillance piece, ensuring that we have the tools and the capacity to do outbreak detection and enhance surveillance. So some of these things are underway, even though the bill that is currently being worked on um, for the White House plan is, is working through that. Um, it's currently being scored by the CBO before legislation will be released. Um, but some things are already in motion, including progress towards a CLIA waived point of care hepatitis C RNA test, which we are hopeful that will be available commercially this summer. And it's already summer, so very soon. Um, and so what would all of these pieces look like? And I guess sort of the impetus for why we're here today, looking at a same day test and treat approach for hepatitis C. So being able to use the point of care HCV RNA test um, to ensure that folks are diagnosed and linked to care within the same visit. Um, so even when we have this test available, there may still be a lot of barriers to ensuring that folks are um, diagnosed and linked within a single visit, um, such as um, limits to the fact that there's no point of care testing for hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, and then there's also a lot of labs and things that are required for a treatment initiation. All right. 
right. So I'm going to turn it over to Tim to talk to us a little bit about what Rapid Start looks like for HIV and some of the, the opportunities and some challenges for implementing for hepatitis C. Great. Um, thank you, Zakia, and uh, good afternoon um, to you all. Uh, it really is a great pleasure to be here, um, um, and I am really thrilled to uh, uh, to sort of share the little black box stage here uh, with uh, just some really incredible folks uh, um, who uh, I, I had the fortune of uh, uh, doing this presentation with uh, previously at the at the NASDAQ annual meeting. So uh, uh, again, just really thrilled to be here. So uh, next slide, please. So really what we wanted to do, um, or like what I wanted to do in order to provide some context or some level setting, you know, for the real sort of expertise here, um, and to really to help to, to maximize and enrich uh, some of the conversations that Thaddeus will be leading, um, we just sort of wanted to give everyone sort of a, uh, you know, a 50,000 foot view of uh, HIV rapid start and including some of the work that we've been doing at NASDAQ uh, uh, looking at this. So, you know, just really quickly, um, rapid start um, is um, effectively an evidence-based intervention whereby antiviral therapy is initiated uh, typically on the day of HIV di diagnosis or uh, as soon as possible. Um, you know, different programs have different criteria for this. Sometimes it's within two days, sometimes it's within seven days, sometimes it's within 14 days of that diagnosis. Um, really, and I want to stress here that that is in association with an individual's readiness to begin HIV treatment. That really is a considerable factor in this, that this isn't simply a clinical, like, you know, drugs into body perspective. Uh, you know, there really has to be a, a very clear understanding understanding in terms of, you know, what an HIV diagnosis means, like, you know, what uh, treatment uh, can actually provide, um, and to really sort of assess the readiness um, to begin treatment. Um, and in terms of rapid start, this also does apply to rapid reinitiation of, uh, of antiretroviral therapies in association with relinkage uh, to care. So for individuals who have dropped out of care um, or have stopped treatment, uh, so that rapid start, you know, is a component of that, that relinkage um, into uh, HIV uh, treatment and care. And so um, when we start to think about rapid start, um, uh, it really does involve HIV systems, you know, of testing, linkage, application, and enrollment in relevant programs and treatment initiation um, all must be tailored to be low barriers. So this really is a systems coordination perspective uh, for, for rapid start. And uh, really the, the, the sort of like the key here, uh, at least from the HIV um, standpoint, um, has to be ensure that all of those can be mobilized very quickly. Um, and again, really low, threshold, you know, particularly for the individual um, who uh, is newly diagnosed um, and uh, needing to start treatment. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of quickly, in terms of the rationale of rapid start. So first, um, you know, in uh, clinic-based uh, studies in the U.S., as well as randomized controlled trials um, that have been conducted in resource-limited ses um, uh, settings, you know, immediate um, antiretroviral therapy initiation has been shown to both reduce the time to care um, um, and also of uh, virologic suppression. Now, in terms of like what this means in, in like in terms of like long term outcomes, like you know those uh, sort of potential improvements really have not yet been um, been established. Um, however, uh, that is something that um, uh, that a number of research teams are potentially looking at. Really, the sort of the, the clinical and even the social sort of benefits of that rapid start um, over the long term. Um, and uh, rapid um, uh, intravitreviral therapy initiation may bring earlier benefits in terms of both personal health, as well as early reductions in the risk of ongoing uh, transmission of HIV. So in this case, you know, uh, getting a uh, viral load to um, uh, to suppressed as quickly as possible really is like, you know, that is untransmittable. So again, undetectable equals untransmittable or U equals U. So now for persons with acute HIV um, um, infection, uh, you know, one of the longstanding, um, oh, Zakia, can you, there you go. Uh, perfect, thank you. So for persons with an acute HIV infection, immediate antiviral viral therapy may in fact limit um, the HIV viral reservoir. So in fact, uh, you know, if um, HIV treatment, um, um, it is hypothesized that if HIV treatment is started within hours or days of infection, it could actually prevent the seeding um, of, uh, of uh, these like long lived CD4 cells that really do uh, you know, serve to be uh, one of the biggest challenges in terms of eradicating HIV. So this is one of those sort of scientific um, areas of discovery that is that is still being looked at. 
And then finally, initiating art um, on first clinic visit after diagnosis has become, you know, standard of care in a number of clinics and jurisdictions. Again, particularly those um, that have been in a strong um, you know, position to, to to leverage and mobilize those various different systems and sort of clinical uh, modalities as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, just in terms of like, you know, where we are in terms of like some of the best practices, where we are with uh, um, particular like, guidance in this. So I've uh, uh, indicated here that some language that is in the, the interretroviral treatment guidelines uh, that are uh, uh, maintained by uh, by the Department of Health and Human Services and really what they state in those guidelines in their HIV treatment guidelines is that, that you know, rapid start um, is it, it, it is recommended. Uh, uh, just based on um, clinical evidence uh, to decrease the time to viral, uh, viral suppression uh, for individual patients and to improve rate of virologic suppression among uh, people with HIV. And what I've included on the right here um, really is a policy clarification notice uh, from the HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau. And this really does apply to uh, to all Ryan White programs. So all of the, the Ryan White parts, A through F, um, as well as AIDS drug assistance programs. And really what they indicate in there um, is that recipients, so again, those Ryan Weiss and ADOPS um, are encouraged to develop protocols to facilitate the rapid delivery of Ryan White services, including the provision of antiretrovirals for those newly diagnosed or re-engaged in care. So here, what we have is, you know, multiple sort of like HHS, um, you know, agencies and divisions, you know, that really um, are promoting and really investing in rapid start for people with HIV. Next slides. Okay, so in terms of components of um, um, uh, HIV rapid start, so first, again, we have a, a HIV testing, you know, uh, obviously a key component to that. And step two then becomes like linkage from testing programs to care and treatment. And uh, we see different sort of like approaches to this uh, sort of like, you know, out there in, in the U.S. You know, some of them um, are actually very like active referral process where somebody that may actually be diagnosed with HIV uh, via like a point of care test, um, you know, at a, a testing site. And there Will be a very active sort of um, you know facilitation of getting them to an HIV care site like in that same day, technically within an hour um, after being tested. Certainly, a big part of that is education counseling on antiretroviral therapy. So this sort of like circles back to the the insurance uh, that somebody is ready to actually begin antiretroviral therapy, because unlike um, hepatitis C, this isn't really about taking treatment for like eight um, week, eight weeks or twelve weeks. Um, this is effectively a lifelong commitment uh, to uh, HIV treatment. So that education and the counseling component really is vital to ensure that uh, there is a very clear understanding in terms of what rapid start is what HIV treatment is more broadly. Um, uh, there's also accelerated access to medical visits. So again, just making sure that that individual um, has access to, uh, you know, not only um, all nursing and uh, any sort of uh, uh, higher level medical professionals, but also any case management, any sort of medical case management that is actually uh, required. Then, of course, there's early access to antiretroviral therapy. And really, just because that really, and just like hepatitis C, it is the most expensive you know, part of, uh, of uh, care in this case, um, ensuring that all systems are in place to, to establish that early access is key. And then importantly, is an assessment for and linkage to programs assistance, including public and private uh, insurance, um, and Rapp White, Ryan White services and other support services to ensure as a continuity of care. So there's rapid start and ensuring all those systems are like mobilized um, in order to, to meet that immediate need. But it's also really making sure that those individuals are, are, are linked to uh, the, the services that are in fact going to provide them with the services over a long period of time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so I just wanted to quickly highlight here um, for everyone that we do have a resource uh, that is taking a look at rapid start. Um, uh, within the context of ending the HIV epidemics um, initiatives, particularly those that were funded by uh, by uh, uh, by HRSA, um, as well as uh, under the um, uh, uh, yeah, around other sort of facets of this, including Ryan White. Uh, this is a resource uh, that was uh, funded under our uh, Ending the HIV Epidemic Systems Coordination Provider, a cooperative agreement with HRSA. And, <clears throat> really does provide a, a sort of a detailed overview in terms of the various different sort of financing mechanisms that are in place, and additionally how uh, a number of both state and local jurisdictions have uh, um, have rolled out rapid start uh, for HIV in their jurisdictions. Next slide, please. 
So I'm not going to go into into uh, any detail here because I do want to uh, maximize uh, everyone's time to and to engage with our uh, panel today. And really, what's included in, in the, uh, the that resource that I just alluded to uh, was the breakdown of the various different sort of federal funding streams you know, that can be utilized to support rapid start, both uh, rapid start, both in terms of like you know Ryan White like core funding as well as in the HIV um, epidemic initiative funding uh, from HRSA. Uh, next slide, please. Also, what we include in there is in terms of some of the, the more supplemental uh, funding um, that uh, is available to many of these sites to really maximize a rapid start. So that includes a lot of 340B program income funding, as well as the 340B rebates that, that can be generated by, um, by ADAPS. Additionally, uh, we talk about some of the manufacturer assistance programs, which really are critical uh, to a lot of rapid starts. So we talk about that, as well as antiretroviral therapy sample packs in terms of these are samples that are provided by uh, manufacturers, which really have been very, very helpful in terms of um, um, in terms of maximizing rapid start. And again, sort of the, uh, starting therapy as quickly as possible and then taking a look at some of the uh, 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 the, some of the more detailed options that are going to be required to ensure continuity of care. Next slide, please. And just briefly, what I have here is this, like, what you'll find in the uh, in that uh, uh, that resource is a quick overview in terms of the way some jurisdictions have gone about that in terms of like their funding, their eligibility application process, a part of like streamlining that, how they go about medication procurement, um, the goal for time to uh, enter virtual biotherapy, what does their provider network look like um, in terms of uh, you know rapid start, and also what is that transition from rapid start to you know really to chronic care, um, what does that sort of system look like? So here we have uh, uh, an example of what's happening in the Las Vegas uh, transitional grant area um, with uh, with EHE funding. Next slide. And what we also have is we have some, an example here of like what's happening in Louisiana statewide in terms of how they're uh, mobilizing their Part B and their ADOP dollars and how they're actually working with their Ryan White Part A's um, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, the state of Louisiana to, to mobilize those resources. So next slide, please. So really what I wanted to sort of like end on and sort of like linger on this uh, just for a second here is just taking a look at some of the uh, the opportunities and challenges in terms of what's happening in the HIV space in terms of like a rapid start. And then just beginning to think about this in terms of like, what does this actually mean in the context of hepatitis C? So, you know, first, like when we have things like confirmatory diagnostic uh, testing required, you know, in HIV, like a, a rapid um, you know, immunoassay test, you know, is sufficient um, to establish, you know, a, a chronic HIV infection. There is no need uh, for a uh, for a PCR to confirm that. While PCR is absolutely critical in that, you know, getting the, the, a, a blood draw for PCR is really important for that baseline assessment. It is not required to actually um, to confirm diagnosis. So therefore, treatment can be started you know, before. Uh, um, uh, well, I, I actually, you know, uh, a treatment can be um, you know, implemented you know, before any viral load you know, test has been received. Um, and in terms of hepatitis B infection marker testing requirement in HIV, that is not the case. Now, that is to say hepatitis B infection markers really are critical uh, to uh, for the, the continuity of treatment simply because like as with um, um, hepatitis B, for example, um, if you discontinue um, lamivudine or you discontinue emtricidibine and you have chronic hepatitis B um, infection, that can lead to, uh, to, uh, to flares. So that is really important to know for HIV. But again, it is not an actual condition uh, for, 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 for rapid start, whereas in hepatitis C, um, that hepatitis B infection like marker testing um, you know, is a requirement before a, a direct acting antiviral can be prescribed. Also, inclusion in evidence-based and practice guidelines in the case of HIV, that is a yes, and I showed you the um, excerpt from the uh, from the HHS um, antiretroviral treatment guidelines for the hepatitis C. We don't have anything yet from, um, from AALCLD. <laughs> Um, in terms of rapid start uh, for that um, inclusion in the White House um, HHS national strategy. So again, in, um, in HIV, both in the uh, the EHE um, guidance as well as the national HIV A strategy, rapid start is a core feature of that. Whereas in hepatitis C, you know that is proposed as Zakia um, referenced earlier. You know federal funds you know can be used to purchase medications, so HRSA funds can be both in the Ryan White side as well as the ADEP side. Whereas CDC, um, there's a lot more restrictions in terms of using those federal funds to actually purchase medication. 
manufacture intraviral viral therapy, um, you know, and uh, direct acting antiviral sample packs. In HIV, we do have them. So Bictarvi, you know, one of the, the, the leading agents for the treatment of HIV, there are starter packs, uh, which makes uh, implementing rapid start right there in the clinic uh, much easier. Hepatitis C, we do not have that for any of the available for direct acting antivirals. Um, also, rapid start you know, regimen selection considerations. Now, in HIV, we do have those. Just, just given uh, some of the, the limitations and the potential adverse events that are associated with some of the more commonly used ARV drug products, um, there really are some considerations on that. Whereas hepatitis C, um, there is not, other than for patients with compensated cirrhosis and with a genotype 3, um, uh, there's, uh, there are going to be some con uh, conditions in terms of um, um, Epclusa selection, in terms of the length of therapy there. And then finally, um, rapid patient assistance program enrollment, uh, which applies to the manufacturer patient assistance programs. You know, HIV, a uh, number of the, uh, the interventional viral, ther uh, inter viral therapy manufacturers have really been great about sort of like implemented expedited review processes so that um, those uh, their, their applications for a patient assistance program can be processed very, very quickly uh, with the potential of getting medications the same day. With hepatitis C, that really has been a challenge. Um, 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 including with Gilead Sciences and ASIGUA, um, as well as AVI. There's a much more protracted um, application process associated with apps. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Thaddeus uh, to sort of like really gel this down in terms of what any of this actually does mean for, um, for our hepatitis C colleagues. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. And thanks, uh, NASAD, for kind of creating this space, especially for our, our viral hepatitis community. Um, you know, you folks have seen some of the great opportunities that are coming. Zakia talked about the National Hepatitis Elimination Plan um, and also the, you know, opportunities that might be coming up with a point of care RNA test. And I think we even got an email about that earlier this week. So things um, seem to be moving in a, uh, in a direction that's going to be positive for our work in hepatitis C. Uh, Tim also ended with that great slide that summarized you know, what is this compared to HIV rapid start? And you could see there was a lot of challenges for us to still address to truly get hep C rapid start um, on its way. So I'm gonna ask you folks who are participating, you know, really this is an exercise in imagination today. We really hope that you'll be involved. And I'm gonna have a series of prompts that I'm gonna ask our panelists, but if you have things you'd like to add, please feel free to raise your hand or to add in the chat and I'll make sure to read that um, and whether it's relevant to our panelists or overall. Uh, so please consider this. We have opportunities in place that are coming. We have challenges that we can already foresee. So what would this magical world look like? This bold new future where we can do rapid start hepatitis C treatment, right? So again, I'm gonna ask our panelists um, just to kind of consider, and we put the prompts here so you folks can consider this as well. I'm gonna actually ask Zakia, could you go to the next slide? I think the next prompt is a great transition for our uh, discussion that we just had from Tim. So maybe I'll start with my friend Andy from Nebraska, the beef state I just learned. Um, and I'll ask each of our panelists to share a little bit of what they think. So given your program, you know, what are some components of the HIV program that you can foresee being leveraged to, to maybe start hep C rapid start. Um, so Andy, why don't you go ahead and share what your thoughts are to start with? Sure, thank you, Thaddeus. And again, thanks for the opportunity to be here. It has been a dream of mine to be on one of these as a presenter or panelist, so dreams do come true, y'all. Um, so I think um, sort of as Tim was talking about the Ryan White program and just sort of that idea of continuity of services, wraparound services, that's sort of like the gold standard, I think, just in the kind of work we want to do. I know I'm not saying anything new to any of you on this call, but um, I think really looking at how that sort of built can help leverage what we're doing in terms of in the hepatitis space. So just looking at things that we already have um, in, in place, we have a much more robust staff. And by robust staff, we have uh, two people on our HIV team. We have one person on our hepatitis team. We are a low incident state, I will mention. Um, but really leaning on the resources that Ryan White has available and looking at uh, some of their rebate money and the flexibility that they have. So I think looking at 
Um, you know, the co-infection of HIV and HCV, that's like a no-brainer to get people at least linked to care. Um, but we have established partnerships with some really good community groups. Um, we in Nebraska only have one uh, AIDS service organization that is statewide. They have five sites throughout the state. And they have been a really good partner with our hepatitis program, too, in terms of their participation in our elimination coalition, um, driving our elimination elimination plan, uh, helping with our outbreak response, and just really helping us sort of connect those dots um, for people living with HIV. But I think that can really be leveraged uh, for our hepatitis C program as well. Um, and then really tacking on, I think, you know, the goal that we have, and I think it's sort of similar across the board, but really trying to combine our contracts instead of having, like we have two for uh, HIV prevention and surveillance with some local health departments, like why not just do that in one, but really looking at our infectious disease program as a whole and how we can kind of braid that funding in the contract initially, so then we can just mitigate any um, additional troubles that that causes having to oversee a bunch of contracts. So I think we, there are things that we have in place that could be helpful in terms of looking towards this pie in the sky vision of doing that rapid start treatment. Um, but yeah, I'll just kind of leave it there. I'll, I'll pass it on to the next one. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. And um, you know, you mentioned a lot of great things that uh, Tim had kind of referenced, you know, staffing infrastructure um, with our HIV programs, Ryan, why uh, rebate money, so really addressing some of the funding opportunities, perhaps, um, you know, putting contracts together, co-infection, and of course, our community uh, coalitions and the relationships we have with them. So um, from beef to pine trees, I'm going to ask Chloe, I literally Googled to see what the, what the uh, main was. So is it, is it pine Chloe, tree? It's not the lobster state. Oh, is it, I, I don't know. According That's to great. Google, yeah. According That's to Google, great. Yeah. So clearly, you know, um, Andy mentioned some. I don't know. I want to know if you want to amplify any of those or add any additional in terms of looking at our current HIV infrastructure. I guess in Maine and how that might be applied to Hep C um, rapid start for treatment. Yeah. So probably similar um, thought process in terms of integrating things that are already happening. So when I when I think of leveraging, I, I try to think first of the spaces that people are going to. So what are, what are the physical spaces that, um, for example, with hep C, I'm prioritizing people who inject drugs. So where, where are the spaces that they're going to be um, and how can we bring hep C treatment, testing, screening to them in those spaces? Um, but then the other one in terms of integration is, um, that we've talked about and that I think is really promising is the the use of DIS, um, who are already having conversations often with the same population that are really going to benefit from um, more direct linkage to care, more direct um, conversations about counseling on the importance of hep C testing, screening, and, um, and initiating treatment. And then also what what we've um, we've just brought on staff um, a prep navigator, PEP and prep navigator, um, as well as a Hep C navigator, and I saw that Helen is on, so um, that's great. So um, just starting to expand programs to think about individuals who can do really personalized follow up um, to those who need it most, and I'm really pleased that we've done that. Helen's position as the um, Hep C navigator is a new one but we're sort of modeling it off the, the prep PEP um, DIS um, navigator model. So that's, um, I, you know, we'll learn from that, but I think just having someone who is doing individualized follow-up is, is gonna be really beneficial. That's so fantastic. And Chloe, I, I'm gonna guess that you will probably get emails about what that position looks like and how you folks got that. Oh yeah. Including yeah. for myself. Yeah, yes. so. Happy to talk about it. Very exciting. Um, and, you know, and I think noting that, as you said, Chloe, that having that specific staff dedicated using a model that you are folks are already familiar with, I think it's such a fantastic idea. Um, I'll note that something that in Hawaii we found valuable recently is to leverage opioid settlement monies to fund something like that, uh, a similar position in our SSPs or syringe exchanges. So uh, really touching on everything that you had mentioned, Chloe. So thank you for that. 
Um, my friend Rob from, according to Google, the centennial state uh, of Colorado, <laughs> I'm going to ask you, Rob, anything you want to amplify or add to um, the great ideas that Chloe and Andy already shared? I think Andy and Chloe hit on a lot of the same thoughts that I was having. You know, a lot of the HIV testing sites that we fund are also syringe service program operators and are also doing rapid hep C testing already. Some of them do also provide hep C linkage to care services. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity just to build off, off of that infrastructure. Um, I think some ideas for the, the future uh, would, would definitely include, as, as other folks were saying, kind of replicating the, the, the infrastructure in the health department of DIS and stuff like that for specifically hep C that already exists for HIV. And I think one other thing that, that I've been, um, I've had in my mind would be, um, uh, you know, using our, uh, in, in Colorado, we call our AIDS drug assistance program, the state drug assistance program, because it cover, covers not only people living with HIV, but it also covers people who are vulnerable to acquiring HIV, so PrEP. Um, and I think there's, uh, and, and we've, we've had some conversations about what would it look like to also expand, expand the state drug assistance program to include treatment for mono-infected individuals and, and the services for them. I think, you know, in particular, I think a lot of the services needed are those the lab work and the, the cost of, of um, the medical appointments as opposed to actually the cost of the medication because that is accessible through patient assistance programs and stuff like that. And then um, our state drug assistance program also has a, a network of providers that are kind of like the, the go-to providers when, when um, someone doesn't have insurance. And I think that a lot of them could be a great resource for potentially doing a rapid start program for hepatitis C specifically, since they already have these great avenues for getting people started on HIV care and on PrEP. Great. Thanks, Rob. I mean, such great. I was writing uh, down about your state drug assistance program. I think it's so amazing that you folks have that and um, expanding that capacity or that opportunity for hepatitis C mono-infected treatment would be uh, so fantastic. So I'm going to look to you folks in the future if that happens. Um, you know, you folks brought up some really good ideas and, and Rob, you already alluded to some uh, challenges. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, I know we have a lot of opportunities that you folks have brought up with workforce, with DIS models, with possible funding, and especially I think you, you all noted our community collaboration, whether providers, aid service organizations, or syringe exchanges. Um, but as we saw in that last slide from Tim, there's a lot of pieces that are still missing for hep C rapid start. So I'm gonna ask us to, in this imagination exercise, consider those what those challenges would be. Um, and maybe if you have an idea, how you might address it in your state or jurisdiction. So I'll go in reverse order just to kind of um, honor everyone's um, opportunity. So Rob, do you mind going first, um, identifying some challenges you can foresee and maybe some opportunities to kind of address them? Yeah, I, I think the biggest one that keeps on coming to my mind is something that, that Tim mentioned, and that's that's kind of patient readiness. And we know that um, you know, so many, so many folks living with hepatitis C, especially folks that 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 um, need and deserve access to treatment the most, have so many complications in their life um, and and so many reasons that prevent them from accessing healthcare, whether that's racism in the medical system. Um, the stigma against people who inject drugs, transportation, housing instability, all of that stuff. And being able to address some of those, um, I don't know whether it'd be best to call them social determinants of health or just practical logistical concerns um, would, would, be, uh, would be just such a, a major benefit to, to just allowing the patient to be like, yes, I am, I am in a place where I'm able to actually start treatment um, I think other challenges, big challenges, definitely include just um, convincing providers and clinicians uh, to adopt a, a rapid start practice as, as a practice, uh, providing practical training to providers on how to implement this model and securing the, the, the resources to implement it. Um, it is usually, I don't think it's drastically more complicated than 
than just providing hepatitis C treatment in itself. But there are some steps that that um, the providers would need to put in place to, to make it more more uh, palatable. And I think we as a health department, we're, we're trying to fund, we're funding at least one program that um, that is kind of making the hep C treatment process as quick as possible. I don't know if we could call it rapid start, but in some situations, it certainly is within that, that at least two week marker. Um, so yeah, I think things like uh, incentives for encouraging um, rapid treatment, like like um, um, CMS um, CMS quality measures, those could be, play a big role. Where it's, it's really if clinicians are being measured on how quickly they're starting folks on Hep C treatment, that would that would really prompt a lot of them to start treating quickly. Uh, and I think collaborations between community groups and clinicians, so really bringing bringing those clinical services. Uh, to community settings is going to be really key to rapid start programs. Awesome, Rob. And I think you were echoing what Chloe had shared earlier about, you know, really getting the services where the people are. So Chloe, do you want to add anything to what Rob had shared in terms of additional challenges or opportunities? Yeah, thanks. Um, Rob, Rob already mentioned a lot of what I was going to say, which is great to see that we're um, we're all thinking on the same page. Um, just in terms of integration, I think some of the uh, the challenges that come when we do that is um, overburdening already very stretched, um, whether they're healthcare workers, whether they're um, community health work, community healthcare workers, or people working um, at an SSP um, that already have a lot of tasks to do. So task shifting is is in principle a great model, but when you add other services, um, other responsibilities, it can lead to you know healthcare worker burnout or inadequate services in in one area or another. So something that would be um, really necessary to make sure is remains adequate is um, proper counseling around the importance of of treatment, but also making sure, like Rob said, um, patient readiness. So, what does that counseling look like? That might not be something that we have a lot of resources to train individuals um, who are having the best point of contact with um, patients. Um, and then also just thinking about um, challenges related to adherence and whether uh, the, the provider, the person who's initiating treatment um, is aware of you know, the, the, the success of treatment even without full completion of uh, you know, the recommended course of treatment. I think we all are familiar with the results from the Min Mon study and how, how positive that has been. But being able to to leverage those findings and really help um, tailor a course of treatment to what a person is reasonably able to achieve. Um, so I guess maybe that's more of an opportunity. But looking at looking at adherence challenges not as a challenge, but as actually it's it's an opportunity that we don't have to um, be held back by. I think it's a really good point, Chloe. And I know there's been discussions also around like for surveillance wise, right? Like having a really hard time having folks come back for their SVR at the, yeah. at the recommended time for a care cascade. So I think it's a really good point to consider what does th what that might look like in terms of treatment and also what it looks like for SVR and how that might play out for data as well. And I think Chloe, are you, you're an epi, right? I, I am yes and sometimes yeah. I have to let go of like we may not be able to track this but it's <laughs> right. it's okay the you know the data <laughs> and the surveillance is not um it's not the be all end all so maybe I can give a little when it comes to data quality um and not getting a full care cascade but mm -hmm. yeah what's best for <laughs> for a success of treatment yeah awesome thank you and, you know, Andy, Chloe and um, Rob kind of spoke at multiple levels of what we'd have to look at. I really appreciate that both of them mentioned that patient readiness, you know, in our work in harm reduction, especially, right, having that patient be the center and having them kind of have that autonomy and that power to decide if they want to rapid start hep C. And then they also mentioned kind of larger kind of infrastructural things and structural determinants of health. So um, any 
other levels or any other things you wanted to consider in terms of challenges or opportunities um, in the beef state? Well, sure. Uh, thank you. And I just love hearing what Chloe and Rob have had to say as well. So I feel like coming on, that's like, yes, and. Um, for us, I think one of our biggest challenges is a uh, provider shortage. Um, we have one infectious disease doctor that serves like the greater part of Nebraska. So from where I'm at in the capital city to the far western edge of the state is like a seven hour drive. So we're a very large barren state once we get out into uh, a little bit west of Lincoln. Um, so some things that we've been exploring is we have a really great champion, uh, Dr. Alex Dwarf who works for an FQHC. Uh, he also works for one of our HIV uh, clinics uh, out of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and he is ready and willing to be a provider doing telehealth for people out that don't have uh, access to care. Um, so I think that is probably our number one challenge. And just in general, finding providers for hep C treatment, not even looking at rapid start, has been uh, a very big challenge for us. But our friends in Tennessee gave a really good idea in looking at Medicaid and who's treating uh, hep C through Medicaid to sort of tap into that. Um, which leads me into my next thought is uh, with Medicaid, really um, getting them on board to reduce a lot of the barriers that are in place. So with that uh, scorecard that goes out, thankfully at the beginning of this year, we were able to eliminate the sobriety restriction entirely, which was huge in opening up more individuals being able to access care, but we still have the prior authorization requirement. Um, so things like that, I think if we can work collaboratively, of course, we can't advocate or uh, lobby for any of these changes. But I think uh, leaning on to our community partners that are passionate about this too, um, is really the key, I think, into having some more structural change on a on a government level. Thanks, Andy. And I think that's a really good point, right? We're uh, technically not advocates, but we're always educators. So we can provide education on why this is important. Um, while you were talking, Chloe did uh, put something in the chat. Uh, Chloe, do you want to add anything about the ECHO project and how that might address some of Andy's um, issues for provider shortages? Yeah, um, just a, a plug for Project ECHO. And I know everyone has probably had some interaction with Project ECHO for hep C or, or another condition, but it keeps coming back as um, the best way to move hep C specialty care away from ID specialists to primary care. Now, again, that puts the onus on primary care, which isn't um, a great solution if you don't have a primary care provider, or you can't, there's a six month waiting list for one, um, or if your PCP is not someone who's going to treat you with respect and dignity. Um, but it does give PCPs the uh, opportunity to build their technical expertise to manage a, a patient, even if it's a patient with, you know, more complicated um, hep C, they can reach out to Project Echo for um, specialty consultation. So I think it's, it's a great resource. I'm really happy to see it expanding in all of the states and um, yeah, not just for hep C. That's such a good point, Chloe. I think um, a lot of folks talk about Project Echo as only the training part of it, but you're right. It actually expands the network of care so that primary care does feel comfortable and connected with specialty, specialists locally. So I think it's a fantastic point. Um, I also want to thank Reed for putting a resource from um, New York's um, Hep C Care for Uninsured in New York. And uh, Reed did have a question. So I'll just read it. Unless Reed, do you want to unmute yourself? I'm happy to read it if you're unable. Uh, go for it. I'm, I've been having some uh, computer problems, so it's probably okay. better. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, Reed, uh, from the Empire State. Uh, so kind of a technical question, Reed says, uh, for folks who can't read the chat, but Tim said that HIV starter packs are now available nationally, but hep C starter packs are not. What would it take to make hep C treatment starter packs available and accessible nationwide? And what steps do treatment manufacturers and policymakers need to take? So Tim, if you're still available, would you have anything you want, uh, you're able to uh, address in terms of Reed's question? And then I'll open it up to the panel if they have any insights. Um, yeah, I, I just think it would be, I think this is a really good advocacy point to bring up with manufacturers in terms of what does that look like, um, uh, number one. Number two, and I, I think what we've seen this um, in the uh, in the prep space um, is in terms of round and prep starter packs. Um, 
is that both by leveraging 340B um, as well as the uh, the arrival of generic, um, you know, tenofovir and tricytabine, um, which is now like around $16 per bottle um, compared to the brand name product, which is around $24, $2,500 um, per bottle. Um, it really, that that's created an opportunity for, for, for clinics and providers themselves to, to purchase those um, medications and like basically build their own uh, starter packs. Um, you know, but I, I think that the, 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 the big pink elephant in the room with the, our DAAs is like, those are still very costly medications. Um, so number one, it's like, you know, how, how low can you get that price? Number one, um, even if we're talking about the authorized generics, then number two, um, you know, what is the actual sort of like fiscal resource that can be used to purchase, um, um, those medications it is certainly the issue in terms of like CDC funds, um. Um, so, you know, I, I think that on the uh, the Ryan White aid upside, there might be, you know, a bit more opportunity there for, for co-infected um, individuals. But I think when we're talking about like, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, hepatitis C mono infected uh, folks, I think it's, 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 it is a big question in terms of what is the mechanism for purchasing um, and what is the cost. So um, I will just sort of like, you know, drop um, into the conversation that I think this is a really worthwhile conversation for us to be having with that manufacturers um, uh, just to see what that potential looks like there uh, for starter packs. Awesome, Tim, thanks so much. And I, as one of our uh, national leaders, I'm sure NASDAQ will have some of these discussions, but if any folks have their own kind of contact, I think it's a great opportunity to mention at least and start discussion. But I wanna see if any of our panelists wanna to respond to Reed's comment or if anything else to add to what Tim had shared. Um, so I don't I don't know that much about the pharma requirements, but um, we do have industry partners in our Hep C elimination um, steering committee and, and planning group, which is, we thought long and hard about whether that was appropriate and, and positive. Daisy. But I think when it comes to things like this, um, it it is really helpful to have them at the table. So I will find a way to bring this up and see if we can get um, feedback from them. But the other thing is, I mean, for, for HIV, a starter pack is great because that's lifelong medication. But for hep C, uh, what would be even better is getting your full course of treatment in one go. Um, because I mean, a starter pack is, is nice if you're going to be on that medication for the rest of your life, but if you can get all the medication that you need to, to cure hep C, um, I, I would like for that to be the goal rather than a starter pack. And I know yeah, that comes it, with challenges, but that's my dream. If I, yeah. And if I can just build on that, it was just like, I think one of the challenges that we've had with, um, patient assistance programs, um, I think, uh, you know, at NASDAQ, we did quite a bit of work uh, with uh, Indian Health Services, and I think they were attempting to leverage uh, uh, the manufacturer patient assistance programs. And uh, what happened was, while, you know, like IHS was very successful in terms of getting um, those patient assistance uh, program drugs, you know, shipped to the clinics uh, for distribution, um, the problem is that process, particularly with the DAAs, you can actually take weeks. So what was happening is they were getting a lot of that medication back. But there was a lot of abandonment because they weren't able to get those uh, uh, those you know those clients back into the clinic uh, to receive that medication. So so you know I just want to you know really sort of like you know shout out to Chloe for that um, you know observation in terms of you know what is the potential to get all eight weeks or all twelve weeks of medication like to get those packs in the clinic um, for uh, you know starting immediately if appropriate. Yeah, that's a oh. Yeah, and that's a really great point, Chloe. We see similar issues. Um, we don't have prior authorization in Hawaii, technically, but uh, for Medicare, but we have lots of specialty pharmacies and pharmacy benefit managers that do, in a sense, put prior authorization in place so that our folks can't get those um, the medications in a timely manner. So I really appreciate you putting bring that up. I know we have about seven minutes left, and we have a lot of comments in the chat. So related to that. Um, Brooklyn did note from Minnesota's perspective that um, prior authorization requirement perhaps he makes time, that timely treatment difficult. I don't know if Chloe, Andy, or Rob, um, you folks had anything to share around that prior authorization challenge, if you're still seeing that, or as I mentioned, like the pharmacy benefit manager side for um, MedQuest. So anything you folks wanted to add around that and how you address that challenge? 
I'll just say we can empathize and uh, we share similar sentiments. Unfortunately, I don't have any solutions, but yeah, it is it is frustrating and, and adds that additional barrier. Thanks, Andy. Rob or Chloe, anything that you want to add or if even how you folks were able to remove prior authorizations, um, any insights you'd like to share? We, we did uh, in Colorado, prior authorization was removed from Medicaid um, pretty recently, just at the beginning of 2003. It has made a huge difference and, and there are now some, some models that we have of, of clinics that are basically doing rapid start or have the potential to do that when, within you know maybe 14 days, I would say is, is a realistic timeline for that. And it really wouldn't have been possible if Medicaid still hadn't placed prior authorization requirements. Um, I think the way that um, it was finally, we finally got rid of it, a part of it was kind of an advocacy effort amongst um, medical providers within the Viral Hepatitis Elimination Coalition. And um, I think there's a growing body of evidence that shows why prior authorization doesn't make sense. Not to say that evidence is going to evidence and science and all the proof you could find is going to convince your Medicaid program to, to change. But I think that is what kind of made the difference for us. Um, and I, I will also mention, um, it sounds like this is the case in Washington now also, that um, Colorado Medicaid also allows for up to 90 day fills of DAAs so that someone can get their complete course of treatment all in, in one go. That's so great to hear. And for folks who can't see in the chat, uh, Rob is alluding to Washington states uh, being allowed to distribute eight weeks of Maverick at least at one time. And thanks Chloe for your comment. Um, you folks are working on removing prior authorization. So looking forward to that. Uh, for us also, we, as Andy alluded to, um, that report card really was helpful in Hawaii to kind of move it along and kind of, in a sense, um, remind our Medicaid um, what other states are doing. So if that's helpful, always feel free to reach out. Um, and in the last four minutes, you know, an important question, and and, for, uh, and so thank you, Abira, for sharing this. Um, panelists, if you don't mind kind of addressing this question, what are the alternative ways we can take to eliminate hep C at the state level if SSPs are not permitted in that state? And I think this is an increasingly important question. So anyone want to take a stab at that uh, to start? I don't want to like hog time, but I can say that in Nebraska, as a state that does not allow SSPs, um, creates some major challenges, of course. Um, what happened in our last legislative session is a newly formed uh, harm reduction coalition uh, was able to work with one of our state legislators to put forth a bill that would allow for SSPs to happen. Um, it did pass, which was remarkable. Um, the governor vetoed it and then they lost votes so they couldn't override the veto. However, there are plans to like pursue that again, but I think really, again, I think the sort of theme of this is, is really leaning on the community partners to do some of that, uh, just with some of the logistics of what we can and can't do, but educate, of course, and provide that info to them. But yeah, I really think those grassroots organizations that are really passionate about making some moves are going to be great champions. Thanks, Annie. We're hopeful for next session. Chloe? And I would just add, you know, in the short term, um, while legislative action can be very slow, um, focusing on EDs, uh, emergency departments, and correctional settings. So other points of contact that we know folks um, are having with a set infrastructure that has medical providers that are capable of providing all of these services, um, letting those be maximized and, and treating screening and treating as many people as possible um, while working on, you know, parallel need of SSPs of harm reduction services. Great point. As Andy said earlier, yes, and. So thanks for that perspective, Chloe. Um, Rob, anything you wanted to add as we start to kind of close out for today? No, I think that is a really difficult situation because, of course, SSPs, we all know, are one of the best tools we have for preventing hepatitis C and one of the, the cheapest and more most affordable and that they're they're being 
thwarted um, is is just such a disappointment. Yeah, and you know, I think thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank all the panelists today. I know we're at the very end, so I appreciate um, all the great comments and insights that you folks provide. Thank you, Tim and Zakia, for this space. I actually will follow up with NASA's um, drug user health team and the HEP team about the particular question on how to address that. So Abir, I'll follow up for you. But uh, can we just give a round of applause for all of our panelists today virtually? And um, I'll turn it back to, to Zakia to close this out and I think ask you all to evaluate the session. But thanks everyone again for um, imagining the future with us. Yes, thank you all so much for this session. I think it's been, I don't know, it's just really great. And I don't know, I just, I like thinking of what we can do with the resources we have. Um, and we have a lot of resources, even though sometimes it doesn't seem that way. Um, we did have some other questions, but these slides will be on the website. So maybe these are things that through your programs, you can start thinking about as you look towards what this may look like in the future if we get funding. Um, so it might be some things to consider. Um, but yes, as Thaddeus mentioned here, again, is the link for our year three feedback survey to hear a little bit more from you all about what you all liked, what you all would like to see more, what you don't want to see um, for the next iteration of the VLC. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you all so much, panelists. Um, and I don't know, this is a conversation we can keep going. So, um, well, I mean, not literally, but <laughs> but that we can keep having as, as time goes on. So feel free to let us know any of your thoughts or feedback. Um, and we can definitely continue to discuss this. So everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.